uh, welcome to this uh, workshop, hybrid workshop on uh, how to do safe lab caller. Uh, this is a part of the series of webinar that uh, as a society, endoscopic and uh, laparoscopic surgeon of Asia, we are organizing. Uh, you will see that we already start to do a series of uh, basic course. And then today we will have uh, the first uh, uh, part of the laparos safe laparoscopic cholecystectomy course. We will move on with ventral hernia, inguinal hernia, and more coming up. Uh, this uh, hybrid course is organized to provide a surgical educational program during this time of COVID in which you cannot really uh, run on-site course as we usually do. And the course is usually divided in, in three parts, the lecture and test, the video masterclass as a second part two, and the last one will be a, practically a self and zone training in which we will ask you to produce some uh, uh, video on your skill training, depends on the course. But we also want you uh, to identify a training, for example, training center in your country. We have so many uh, training centers. You can see today we have a, a Dr. Professor Tuan from Ho Chi Minh. He also organized a course of Vietnamese uh, colleagues and participants can attend the course in, in Ho Chi Minh. Similar for, uh, for Philippines, you can attend course organized by Dr. Alan Bonafé, that is the, the director of the PICAS course in Manila. So we have opportunity in Singapore, you can come to SDC. I think there are a different opportunity and training center that uh, uh, are able to accommodate your training. After that, you will receive a full certification. So today course uh, will be coordinated by Professor Toon, Professor Bonafé, uh, both are uh, great experts, a great surgical educator and uh, I want to introduce them. Professor Tun is a professor, associate professor at the uh, University uh, of uh, Medical uh, Med uh, University Medical Center in Ho Chi Minh. He's uh, the head of hepatobiliary unit, but he does uh, uh, a wide variety of uh, general surgery procedure. Uh, Dr. Buenafe is a senior consultant at uh, at the uh, uh, Cardinal Santos, Ma is also a lecturer at the Rizal University and director of the MIS program at that university. Uh, plus, uh, I have a wide variety of practice in general surgery uh, procedure. Uh, Dr. Sajid Malik is an uh, associate professor at the Al Jinnah uh, Hospital in Lahore, in Pakistan, and a senior consultant, another expert surgeon. Same uh, professor Van Pinay is an associate professor at the UMC in Ho Chi Minh and uh, uh, ran a lot of courses together with Dr. Professor Ton in Ho Chi Minh. Dr. Sujit Vijayaratna is a consultant uh, at the uh, National University Hospital in Alexander Hospital. Uh, his passion is uh, widely recognized for his teaching and uh, is involved in, in several academic activities of uh, ELSA OP. Uh, last but not least, Professor Srida is the head of uh, hepatobiliary unit uh, at the uh, National Uni Division of uh, National University Hospital. He's the director of, of uh, the liver transplant in, uh, in the US and a wide variety in uh, expertise, especially in program regarding uh, safe cholecystectomy. Without further delay, uh, let me uh, pass the microphone to to Alan Buenafe and Tun for uh, for uh, opening and starting the webinar. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, David Lomento, uh, Professor David Lomento, for uh, your kind introduction. Uh, I'm very pleased, very honored to coordinate this course with uh, Dr. Alan Buenafe, past president of ELSA. And uh, I think ELSA have a very, uh, are doing very good job on training uh, in the area of pandemic. So now we can start our uh, first uh, topic from uh, Sajid.
uh, anatomic mm -hmm. consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Tuan. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Lumanto and uh, Professor Allen and Dr. Uh, Tuan uh, for a brief introduction. And uh, let me slide uh, some. Okay. Well, uh, for the first topic for the safe laparoscopic cholecystectomy for today is anatomical consideration. And um, uh, while doing a laparoscopic uh, cholecystectomy, and my name is Dr. Sajid Malik and working in Jinnah Hospital Lahore in Pakistan. And uh, I always acknowledge my mentor, Professor Lumanto and my colleague, Dr. Sweetith, um, uh, for always uh, um, preparing all these slides and, uh, uh, and uh, seeking guidance uh, from them. I have nothing to disclose. By the end of this module, the participants would be able to identify the various anomalies uh, with their practical significance for a safe laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Um, before going in, jumping into the anatomical um, uh, understandings and the misunderstandings, there are a few uh, predisposing factors which you should keep in mind, uh, which are actually a predisposing factor for a bile duct injury and the vascular injuries, uh, because they are related to the anatomy and the structural misidentification. And the most common mechanism of such injuries are basically misidentification of CBD or um, taking common hepatic duct as a cystic duct or misidentification of hepatic artery as a cystic artery. If we talk about the anatomy, um, sorry, just, uh, yeah. If we talk about the anatomy um, and its variation, the typical textbook anatomy is present only in 15 to 20% of the patients. And uh, the rest of the variations are uh, the common which we come across in our daily um, uh, practice. And a safe cholecystectomy, I must say that is the one which is safe not only for the patient, but also for the operating surgeon because of a lot of litigation these days. So the learning objective, and I will divide my presentation into three different sections for a learning module into the arterial anatomy and its variations, ductal anatomy and its variation, and other anatomical important landmarks. So the first is the arterial anatomy and its variations. If we talk about the arterial supply, the right hepatic duct, which actually supplies the gallbladder, the right hepatic artery, which give rise to a cystic artery as well, it enters the calyx or, or uh, uh, the new terminology, which is called a hepatocystic triangle in relation to the common hepatic duct. It enters into the hepatocystic triangle behind to it in 87% of the cases and anterior to it in 13% of the cases. An aberrant right hepatic artery has been found in 18% of the cases. So why right hepatic duct is important? Because the ignorance of this variation may provoke unexpected hemorrhage and any attempt any attempt to control this hemorrhage can lead to a biliary injury as well. So the first abnormality or the variant of the right hepatic duct, which could be found is a caterpillar hum or demonian hum, which is actually the right hepatic duct artery, which is tortuous and rendering the cystic artery short. And the mechanism of injury is when the right hepatic artery is tortuous, cystic artery is actually staying behind it and actually it's a hiding behind it and might be injured if not identified correctly. Here in this video, I can show you, uh, the, so actually the trip, trick to avoid injury to the right hepatic artery is keeping the dissection of the artery close to the gallbladder and onto the right side of the cystic uh, uh, lymph node, uh, lymph node of known, which is a, um, a fixed anatomical landmark. Here, if I can show you, if you can see the right hepatic artery, so cystic duct is ligated first, ligated, and then monian hump is, you can visualize the monian hump, cystic artery is identified and ligated between the clips, uh, ligated with the clips and uh, incised between the clips. So the second thing is the cystic artery itself. So cystic artery usually arise from the right or the aberrant right hepatic duct in the colored triangle. 
And only in 17% of the patient, it has a typical textbook anatomy. Uh, and in the rest of the patient, it has a variation and that could be due to the, its location, number or the source uh, from where it is actually arising. If we talk about the number, the variation according to the number of the cystic artery, it has a superficial and the deep branch, which is called sometimes anterior and the posterior branches as well. And uh, the division of these should be done onto the hepatic surface of the gallbladder. And if we talk about the variation according to the source, the normal source of the right cystic duct is the right hepatic artery, but in other cases, it could arise from the left hepatic artery or sometimes from the gastroduodenal artery as well, or from anterior to the common hepatic duct from arising from the uh, taking a tortuous route or sometimes as a uh, the right or the, uh, double, cyst double cystic artery as well. So variation according to the location. So location could be found either inside the Keller's triangle or outside the triangle. If you talk about inside the Keller's triangle, it might be a double. I, I can show you in this video. Um, uh, here you can see the double cystic artery. So when we, when the uh, dissection was done, so here you can see, and this one and and the base here sorry it's incomplete uh, so how can we avoid the cystic arterial injuries so avoidance of the cystic arterial injuries is basically divide the cystic artery as i mentioned you earlier close to the gallbladder and staying lateral to the um, uh, to the uh, uh, lymph node of the lung and why it is important because it will prevent the injury to the right hepatic artery and also to preserve branches which are supplying to the CBD as well. The second part is the ductal anatomy and its variation. So ductal anatomies are more, uh, the arterial anatomy are more devastating per operatively, but the ductal anatomy, they are missed and identified later, but they are more dreadful and, uh, uh, and uh, which is a nightmare for a surgeon. Um, if you talk about the Callers versus hepatocystic triangle, as I was talking earlier, uh, the Callers triangle, typical Callers triangle, is actually is, lies between the Callers uh, between the cystic duct, um, um, the cystic duct, cystic artery, and the right, uh, and the common hepatic duct. Uh, but the cystic artery is neither consistently present or anatomically precise. So uh, um, the content of the Callers triangle uh, is a lymph node of the lung. So uh, the important landmark and the structures which are required for the critical view of safety, uh, they do not come under this Callers triangle. So the new norms and the preferred nomenclature is to use the hepatocystic triangle, which is actually formed by the liver, under surface of the liver cranially, and the common hepatic duct on the medial side, and by the cystic duct onto inferiorly. And this uh, uh, hepatocystic triangle, it contains cystic artery, a variable portion of the right hepatic artery, cystic lymph node, lymphatics, and variable amount of the fibrofatic and active tissue. So all the important structures which are required for the safe performing a safe laparoscopic cholecystectomy come into the hepatocystic triangle. So if I can show you this video, thanks to Dr. Sujit for providing me some of the videos. So here you can see. Uh, of this hepatocystic triangle is very important because remember when you are this hepatocystic triangle can is a dynamic triangle because when you are holding the heart pen pouch and retracting the gallbladder towards the uh, uh, the falciform ligament or the falciform fissure or uh, uh, retracting it cra cranially or the cordly the, the, uh, this um, uh, hepatocystic triangle will change its shape if i can show you in this diagram here if you are retracting it more laterally if you are retracting it more anteriorly if you are retracting it more posteriorly by holding through the uh, the heart pump out the the triangle will change its shape so the dissection in the hepatocystic triangle, uh, the aim should be to clear the hepatocystic triangle slowly using precise and meticulous method and small structure should be burned. So divide only a thin tissues. So in, in order to avoid the injury to the uh, cystic artery and the right hepatic artery as well as the ductal, uh, uh, ductal anatomies. 
Well, uh, the variation into the biliary duct, the second portion in the right hepatic duct have a common variant in 20 to 25 percent of the patient. The, and the common variant is the uh, right and the uh, right anterior and the posterior sectional duct. And the most important among these is, if I can show you here in this uh, the green uh, diagram, uh, when the right posterior sectional duct open with the cystic duct and join the common hepatic, uh, uh, sorry, the common bile duct and mislead it as a uh, uh, cystic duct. So the typical lateral insertion is only seen in 17% of the patient for the cystic duct, and which is found on the cadaveric and IOFC findings. If you look at the, uh, in this diagram, the cystic duct is lying obliquely, which is called as a lateral entry. And it could have a um, uh, the uh, other uh, variation into the, uh, the cystic duct um, cystic duct uh, locations are either it is adherent with the common hepatic duct, which is called, which runs a parallel to the common hepatic duct and um, can injure, um, and the common hepatic duct and the cystic duct could be considered as one structure and uh, could be a devastating um, uh, injury. Or the cystic duct emptying into the right hepatic duct, or it could follow a tortuous route, route or it can um, pass anterior to the common hepatic duct to end behind the, uh, to end behind the uh, uh, second part of the duodenum. So, okay. Uh, the common injury to the cystic duct, why does it happen? In case of inflammation and the repeated infection, there is a lot of, uh, uh, there is a uh, ongoing um, uh, inflammation and the healing uh, scar tissue and the fibrosis, which leads the actually um, uh, short uh, cystic duct as a short or absent variety. This absent, I that were put into the, into the inverted commas because it is um, uh, somehow um, uh, mentioned into the into the literature as an absent cystic artery. But in most of the time, it is not the absent variety. It's actually the short cystic duct because um, because of this repeated infection, inflammation, infection, and fibrosis and thickening, the cystic artery gets uh, small. Uh, cystic, uh, um, uh, cystic duct gets uh, smaller with the passage of time, and it um, ultimately turn uh, either form a Meese syndrome with a fistula without without fistula. And the parallel variety, as I mentioned, is the the one when the cystic duct uh, runs parallel either with the, with the common hepatic duct or the uh, or the CBD. And um, the role of intrahepatic uh, uh, intraoperative fluoroquinone geography may be considered in these patients. Another variety, another anomaly is the subvesical bile ducts. So, subvesical sub bile ducts, these are actually not the duct of the Lushka. The duct of the Lushka is the one which opens intraluminally into the, into, the, uh, into the gallbladder, which, is, which has a mucosal openings. And uh, sometimes it is subvesical duct is um, um, normally taken as a duct of Lushka. It is actually staying outside. And uh, most common cause of the post uh, uh, laparoscopic uh, lap coli bile record, and the incidence is 2%. And it has three varieties sectional, segmental, and the subsegmental. I won't go into the details because of the uh, requirement of the topic. And um, the next is the uh, other anatomical landmarks, which should be keep in mind for a safe laparoscopic cholecystectomy. The first one is the lymph node alone, as I mentioned earlier, falciform ligament, ruvier sulcus, apicolidocal plexus, duodenum, and the cystic plate. So lymph node of the lone, or, uh, which is called as a muscagny node as well, uh, the dissection should be done lateral to the um, um, uh, cystic artery and the duct should be ligated lateral to the cystic, uh, uh, to, uh, to the uh, lymph node of the lone. So which is a fixed anatomical landmark and um, it lies in close proximity to the cystic artery. So the dissection is done and then ligated later to the uh, lymph node. And then come the falciform ligament. The falciform ligament, it, um, it lies between the segment three and segment four of the liver. Uh, if I move on to the next slide here, Ruvier sulcus actually, it has a role here. Ruvier sulcus is not widely known or appreciated by the general surgeons. Actually, it's always safe if we do the dissection above the Ruvier sulcus. What exactly is a Ruvier sulcus? It is, a, it is a plane, if you can see here, it's a naturally occurring cleft in the left lobe in over 80% of the normal liver. And it's useful of but oftenly ignored anatomical landmark. 
and uh, it is best seen when the gallbladder is uh, uh, is holded by the heart band and is retracted towards the umbilical fissure. If ruvia sulcus is not present, this imaginary line, which is starting passing across the base of the segment four of the umbilical fissure, may be extended towards the right across the patrodudinal ligament to a certain the safe zone of the di dissection. So that's why the umbilical. Uh, so that's why the uh, the ruvia sulcus is important because if we do the dissection above the ruvia sulcus, the chance of injury to the CBD would be the less. The next is the epicolidocal um, plexus, which is actually formed by the, uh, the marginal, uh, it is actually the anastomosis between the marginal uh, arteries uh, located at the three and nine o'clock position. And um, it is actually the characteristic vascular pattern outside the CBD and uh, very easy to differentiate from the cystic duct. The next is the duodenum. Any duct that goes behind the duodenum is the CBD. And the last thing is the cystic plate, and the, uh, it's uh, the flat, wide, fibrous sheet located in the gallbladder bed. It is a part of the sheath and join the liver capsule, and it continues with the liver capsule of the segment four medially and the segment five laterally. Here you can see in this video, the dissection should be aimed to uh, lift the, uh, the gallbladder off the gallbladder fossa uh, while um, aiming to not to injure the cystic plate because if there is any injury to the cystic plate, uh, it would expose the um, liver parenchyma that could lead to uh, bleeding as well. So lastly, I would say the misunderstanding of anatomy happen uh, because of the visual perceptual illusion. It could happen like this but you see what you want to see. Do not have a preconceived notion of where structure lies, don't disturb them, and rather have a mindset that various anomalies lie in the area of this dissection. And uh, show your work to others, say nothing, they will blame. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, the best way to recognize the complication is to show your work to the others. Thank you so much. This module is um, completed. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you very much, Suchit for your uh, lecture. So next will be Dr. Phạm Minh Hải from Vietnam with uh, three pork versus uh, four pork cholecystectomy. Let me stop sharing. Yeah, done. Yeah, thank you, Professor Tung, for introduction. Okay, I uh, continue the, uh, with my topic. The topic is laparoscopic cholecystectomy, uh, three pox versus four pox. Uh, can you hear from me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, this is the abbreviation of laparoscopic cholecystectomy in uh, my slide presentation. Um, uh, firstly, um, I would like to talk about the uh, history. Uh, the first laparoscopic cholecystectomy was performed by uh, Philip Moray in uh, 1987. And the case uh, included both gynecological uh, dysiolysis and cholecystectomy. Um, and after that, laparoscopic cholecystectomy was established by Du Bois and Borisat in 1990. Um, at the time, the number of box were four box and the techniques were so-called uh, French technique. Uh, at the same period, uh, a range of um, centers in America uh, uh, did um, uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy too. And uh, the number of box were two box um, too. And uh, the technique were so-called American technique. Um, for French technique, uh, this is a positioning of uh, the patient and team in French technique. Um, the menstruation uh, stay between the patient less and in the left side of the patient, the assistant side and opposite side is for the nurse. Yeah. Uh, and um, in French technique, the trigger side and instrument like this picture uh, I would like to pay attention in the four choker, the four choker in the left side of the patient. Yeah. Uh, 
um, in Ch American technique, um, there was uh, a little uh, difference. The first, with now spread out the, the legs and um, the surgeon on the patient left uh, side. And the far part um, is um, medial inferior to the right costal margin. Yeah, and uh, this picture uh, illustrates the um, choker side in the American techniques. Um, and um, the fireball techniques um, is so called uh, standard laparoscopic cholecystectomy in consensus. And um, the role of the far choker in French technique is uh, lifting the liver. Uh, meanwhile, that of uh, in uh, American technique is uh, retracting the fundus. Nowadays, uh, there are more than 50 technical modifications and they are you know, divided into two groups uh, with reducing size of incision or size uh, or reducing number of parts. With the AMS uh, cosmosis, um, reductions of postoperative pain hospital site and cost. Uh, with increasing experience, especially in laparoscopic surgery, the three parts um, laparoscopic cholecystectomy have, um, have done uh, on over the world. Uh, but um, we need to uh, balance between the safety and other benefits. Um, modify surgical techniques are acceptable when their safety or feasibility. And uh, I would like to send a message, uh, a, an important message. It is not fail if one more pulse is needed. Actually, uh, the three-part cholecystectomy uh, was performed at the early of the laparoscopic uh, area. Um, want a report um, from the Karim Slim. Uh, he reported um, uh, in 1995 and um, in, his, um, in his later, he, um, he had done laparoscopic uh, with the three techniques in 19, since 1989 uh, with uh, 710 consecutive laparoscopic polycystectomy. And nowadays, three bulk laparoscopic cholecystectomy has been aseptic one to one. Um, in the three parts technique, um, we need to uh, we, we don't need a, a fourth part. Uh, so um, the part size uh, like this picture. Uh, in our center, in University Medical Center at Ho Chi Minh City, we do the three bacteria to me, but uh, a little difference from the part size from other center. Um, in this picture, uh, this is the, um, the first stroker, the first stroker for the camera, and the second stroker uh, in the AB gastric region for the digester, and the third stroker uh, a little higher than the other arteries. It's um, in the right side of the patient for hunting. Uh, the data from our center, um, I just get the data from uh, 2089 because I have a problem with our um, network. Uh, in UMC, we have uh, um, approximate 4,000 uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy uh, in four years. And uh, routinely, uh, we begin with the three pox technique. And um, during the surgery, if um, we have uh, difficult for dissecting or for exposing the triangle, um, we will nick one more choker. And uh, in my experience, um, from three years, I have um, 150 laparoscopic cholecystectomy. It uh, includes a non inflammatory gonfladder, acute cholecystitis, and uh, chronic cholecystitis. 
um, um, which uh, we have done originally be, um, beginning with uh, three blocks. In, um, in my experience, no conversion to four block and no conversion to open surgery uh, and no major complication. Maybe uh, I would like to show uh, uh, a short video um, to illustrate um, how to dissect with the three block technique. Yeah, for the left hand, we use uh, the, the rasper to uh, hunt and expose the triangle. And the right hand, you the dissect to um, dissect. Okay, I will skip some. Yeah. Okay, and after that, I expose uh, some content in the triangle. With this video, um, I would like to say that uh, with the three ball technique, we can um, we can expose the triangle um, the clearly, and uh, the dissection uh, is not difficult in selective patient. Uh, from um, the data from uh, Karen Slim, um, the conversion to four box. Uh, was eight uh, percent, and one part was due to acute cholecystitis, and conversion to open surgery approximate to four uh, percent. And uh, this slide showed the reason for converting procedures. Bioduct injury happened in uh, two cases, and one of two cases was a chronic cholecystitis, and he stated that. The outcome was similar to four box technique. Uh, conversion and bioduct injury uh, in um, the, the um, Karen's uh, red box related to cholecystitis. Um, and we have a question is uh, do we need patient selection for three box laparoscopic cholecystectomy or more advanced imaging before the operation? The answer is uh, from a book. Uh, this is a citation from a book. This is a cholecystic laparoscopic cholecystectomy with evidence base. And um, the space uh, is that, uh, yeah. Uh, the three box techniques were found to be safe when performed on acute and chronic cholecystitis and always reach the same results in terms of operation, conversion, and complication and what's of morality, pain and time of this car. So the, um, uh, there is no need of operate clinical and ultrasound patient selection. Turning to the literature, um, this is the um, uh, only uh, the unique uh, meter analysis of randomized clinical trial, which I have searched in the literature. Um, this um, published uh, in uh, 2009, yeah. According to the, the results, uh, there was no significant difference in the operating time, and it was similar to success rate. And how about the uh, analgesia requirements? Um, the results of the meta analysis shows that there was no significant difference between two groups about uh, analgesia requirements. And about uh, um, post operative hospital stay, there was no significant difference between two groups. And um, in conclusion of uh, this article, uh, the two groups were similar in operating time, success rate, and post operative hospital stay, but the safety and cost was not a set. And um, two variables we presented in other articles. 
This is a recent uh, report uh, bu which published in uh, 2016. Uh, this report uh, showed that the three box had a significantly better outcome than four port technique in terms of both surgical pain, hospital stay, and patient satisfaction. And there was no significant difference in complication rate and no see. And in uh, a prospective study uh, published in uh, 2015, including uh, 200 patients, which um, the uh, patient who's um, randomly divided into two groups, one group is uh, three parts and one group is four parts. Uh, they compare the safety, the efficacy, the cost um, the cost effectiveness, uh, communication rate, and incident of conversion between two groups. Um, about the safety, uh, there was no uh, major complication, including uh, mortality and reoperation in both groups. And about the cost, um, the articles are uh, just um, discussion uh, theoretically. Uh, about the cost, they uh, did not assess uh, the actual cost. Um, uh, theoretically, because we reduce uh, one box, so no, no need for the second assistant, and um, the instrument used uh, less than for four box, so they think it can reduce the cost. And. Um, the intraoperative and postoperative complication were similar in both groups. And uh, the postoperative pain were less in the group A. And the group A was a three box technique. The mean hospital stay were less in group A2. And um, better cosmetic results and patient satisfaction were observed in the group of three box technique. Um, in conclusion, um, the, the author stated the three parts technique is safe and feasible methods in hands of an experienced laparoscopic surgeon. Thus, it can be recommended a, a safe continuity to convention, conventional four box laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Uh, in conclusion, the four box techniques. Um, uh, um, people believe that that is the conventional technique uh, and the standard technique now. Um, however, the three box technique uh, shows uh, it is the feasible and safe method too, and uh, it provides some benefits. Uh, and uh, in, an important message do not worry if one more box is required. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Minh Hai, for your presentation. Uh, I know that actually most uh, Asian countries now are using three-port technique, but mostly in the books, we have uh, standard four-port techniques. It's the most uh, standard and safe procedure. So this shows us that three-port technique is also safe and feasible to experienced uh, laparoscopic surgeons. Uh, Dr. Minhai, please stop sharing your screen. Thank you. Minhai, there are some questions. The topic of on the QA. and the critical view of safety by uh, Professor Sujit from Singapore. Uh, hi. Uh, good, afternoon. good evening, everyone. Uh, Prof, you want to, sh shall we answer the questions first or shall I just finish the uh, slides first? No, 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 you had a question. I, would, I was uh, asking uh, Minai to just answer on the chat. No need to. Yeah. Oh, uh, is it? Okay. Min yeah. Minhai, okay. there are two questions for you on to the chat. Uh, you can go there and answer the questions. Uh, thank you, Sudeep. Yeah. Uh, I don't have um, uh, many slides. Uh, because most of it has been uh, addressed by Sajid. Uh, 
Uh, are you all able to see my screen? Can I? Uh, are you able to see the slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, so access uh, for laparoscopic cholecystectomy is quite similar to any other laparoscopic procedure, and uh, I will be talking to you about critical view of safety, which actually suggests uh, address uh, some parts of it. Um, access can be uh, basically what you're comfortable with. So most of us uh, in Singapore, we do open uh, trocar insertion, open uh, procedure. Some people uh, are more familiar with the various needles, so you can choose exactly what you have been doing before and what you're comfortable with. And uh, no access technique uh, is proven to be 100% safe. So there's always uh, issues with uh, bowel injury, with, I mean, visceral injury, vascular injury. So have to be careful and then select the, the, the method of access that you're most comfortable with. Uh, I think I will skip this. Uh, if there's any questions about uh, access, I'm happy to answer separately uh, in the chat box. Okay, so S Sajid mentioned about hepatocystic triangle and, and uh, the triangle of Kellogg's is, is actually uh, not very useful nowadays because um, the main thing about safety, triangle of safety and doing a safe cholecystic lies on your dissection of the hepatocystic triangle. So what is a hepatocystic triangle? So the, what are the boundaries? So the callus triangle is actually part of your hepatocystic triangle. Boundaries of the callus triangle, uh, actually uh, on the right side, you have the proximal part of the gallbladder and the cystic duct. On the left, you have the common hepatic duct, and then uh, it's bounded superiorly by the cystic artery. The hepatocystic triangle, um, on the right side, uh, the proximal part of the gallbladder and the cystic duct, uh, and on the left side is a common hepatic duct. Superiorly is basically bound by the right lobe of the liver. So critical view of safety. Um, there are certain requirements that we need to achieve, uh, especially as a trainee that you need to achieve to prove that uh, you are doing a safe cholecystectomy. Uh, and, uh, and, and in the past, and uh, this the picture of this uh, critical view of safety, uh, an intro picture, uh, was very important. Uh, and uh, even in Singapore, we still used to take uh, the picture because currently we are recording most of the videos, so we don't take the specific picture, but uh, it's very important. So what are the requirements of a critical view of safety? Um, the triangle of Kellogg, as well as the hepatocystic triangle, should be cleared of fat and fibrous tissue. And uh, of course, there's no need to expose the CBD. So uh, first point is actually triangle of callus as well as the hepatocystic triangle should be cleared of fat and fibrous tissue. And the lowest part of the gallbladder should be separate from the liver bed, at least one third of the gallbladder. And then the two structures, uh, which is the cystic duct and cystic artery, and you should only see two structures entering the gallbladder. If you see more, you need to dissect them down to the gallbladder and make sure that it doesn't turn back into the liver. This is, a, this is one of our MCQs that we used to do uh, in our um, outreach program. So according to the SAGES Safe Policy Program, the critical way of safety, uh, what are the components of the critical way of safety? So the color triangle, and the hepatocystic triangle should be clear of fat and fibrous tissue. This I mentioned, lowest part of the gallbladder should be separated from the cystic plate, seeing only two structures, uh, which is the cystic artery and cystic duct should be entering the gallbladder. So to achieve this, what are the certain maneuvers that you need to do? So during a laparoscopic procedure, what is the proper retraction of the fundus of the gallbladder? So you should be uh, retracting the fundus of the gallbladder in the capillary direction. Ideally speaking, uh, you should be retracting towards the 10 o'clock position. Which direction should the heart nurse pouch or the neck of the gallbladder should be pulled or retracted during the action of the calyx? So uh, the correct direction is actually to the, towards the right and towards the call direction. Um, to achieve a safe cholecystectomy, uh, this famous surgeon, uh, from India, uh, Mr. Udwadia used to say, show your care and hug the gallbladder. So stay safe 
to be to stay safe, to, you know, to stay closer to the call letter, in addition to the critical view of safety. So I mentioned this already. Uh, I think uh, Sajid also mentioned quite clearly uh, the certain aspects of anatomy and the variations. So if you if you log on to the Sages Safe Polycystectomy Program, uh, they, there's very nice pictures, there's very nice videos there that you can refer to. And uh, they go into quite detail uh, about this uh, critical view of safety. So, um, there's anterior and posterior critical view of safety. So the anterior, this is the anterior view. So you can see one third of the gallbladder is taken away from the, the, the liver bed. And then uh, you can see later, you can see only two structures. So the hepatocystic triangle is devoid of any fat and fibrous tissue. So only two structures are seen entering the gallbladder. Next, uh, so the same view posteriorly. So you can see very clearly only two structures and one third of the gallbladder is taken away from the liver. So I think that's all I have uh, because the topic is quite uh, specific. So I think I've addressed the concerns. So if there's any questions about it, I'm happy to answer on the chat box. Thanks. Thank you, Sushit. I will stop sharing. So, so we we would like to invite uh, Professor Alan Munafir, past president of ELSA, for the next topic: imaging in Napoli. When and how? Please. Thank you. Thank you. Can you put me on spotlight? You'll see my lecture behind me. Uh, please put me on spotlight. David, there you are. Thank you. Anyway, uh, the topic that was given to me is about intraoperative imaging, when and how. So I'll be talking on uh, the two imaging uh, uh, systems that we can do right now for laparoscopic cholestectomy. So I don't have any disclosure. Uh, the objective for two for today's lecture will be about intraoperative cholangiogram and your ICG or your fluorescent cholangiography. Uh, I'll be talking on the indications and the different techniques on how we do and an overview of the fluorescent uh, cholangiography. Historically, if we look on intraoperative cholangiography, for many of us, when we, every time we think of a, having a good map of what we would want to look on, we always think of an intraoperative imaging, either if you're doing it laparoscopically or open. So we refer to always to the standard intraoperative cholangiography, where we put a dye into the biliary system to look into the anatomy. The primary Reason for that is you would want to have a good map or a good idea of where that common bulk duct is and going anteriorly where it would come into uh, to, to your liver bed. It would give us a definite idea or a definite map of what we're dealing with. Either you have a stone or an injury in this, uh, in this uh, area. So intraoperative cholangiogram or intraop IOC or IOC as we would usually call it is an essential skill component for cholestectomy that each and every one or each and every surgeon, general surgeon, either you're doing laparoscopic or open, uh, should have uh, in, in their armamentarium. You should know how to do your interoperative cholangiogram. It also helps uh, identify difficult or aberrant anatomy of your gallbladder. So hence, all surgeons doing gallbladder uh, surgery should know how to do an IOC. So it's a prerequisite also prior to doing your common bulk duct exploration. Uh, nowadays, prior to doing your, because, because of your MRCPs or ERCP, uh, still your interoperative cholangiogram is a very important uh, armamentarium of a general surgeon. So in the indications for doing your selective cholangiogram would consist of a 
preoperative history of a college tools, patients have icteresia, pancreatitis, or cholangitis. A dilated common bowel duct by ultrasound uh, should be done with an intraoperative cholangiogram, elevated bilirubins, elevated alkaline phosphatase, and of course, anatomy that precludes ERCT, like your previous RUI gastric bypass or your duodenal diverticulum. Hence, you have to do your uh, uh, IOC. Even without preoperative risk factors that I mentioned earlier, IOC may be indicated for a cystic duct uh, at least more than five millimeters intraoperatively when you do when you're doing your uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy or even your open cholecystectomy. A common bowel duct that's more than one centimeter or ten millimeters. A presence of stone or sludge in the cystic duct when you're doing your dissection of that cystic area and you found out that there's a stone, uh, I would usually do an interpretive cholangiogram on my patients. And when you're doing your surgery, you encounter a very difficult or a very unclear anatomy. A interoperative cholangiogram should be done on these patients. Or if you're suspecting for a common bowel duct injury, uh, you're warranted to do your interoperative cholangiogram. Previous to this, uh, if you know your cotton criteria, the cotton criteria has been used by a lot of uh, societies, even with your American Society of Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons. Using the cotton criteria is a risk stratif uh, stratification uh, parameter to assess if the patient has a common bowel duct stone. Uh, we call it a soft sign or hard sign. Nowadays, we call it a... Uh, high or a low incidence for common bowel duct. Uh, Excuse me, Alan. Yes. May you share your screen again? Uh, I'm, I'm sharing my screen. There you are. Please, please share your screen. I yeah. cannot see. Uh, put me on. Can you see it now? No. Anyone see? Anyone see Alan's uh, presentation? I'm on spotlight, right? Oh, when, when he starts to talk, we can see. Yeah, every time I'm talking, you'll see the... Oh, I see, I see. It's behind you, right? Yes. Thank you, thank you. It's it's spotlight. Spotlight. Yeah. Anyway, the risk certification... Uh, Window, we... Alan, the, the quality of the slices, you cannot read. You cannot read? I think better to... Uh, I think just this one. The next slide is okay? This one is okay. Okay. So anyway, the risk certification is just the cotton criteria that tells you for a high risk of having a common bowel duct stone, a low risk for having a common bowel duct stone. I think the best one here is uh, you have to remember that even for patients with low risk of having a common bowel duct stone, you still have at least 10% chance uh, for patients of having a common bowel duct stone, even with a normal or a negative history of uh, alcoholic stones and everything else. So anyway, uh, when you're doing your intraoperative cholangiogram, uh, there are different choices of catheters that you can use to cannulate your cystic duct, depending on which is suited or which is available in your operating room. There are some specialized instruments that, uh, that can facilitate cannulation, uh, like your Kumar's clamp or your Olsen cholangiograsper, or even just your uh, small feeding tube catheters you can use for uh, cholangiography intraoperative cholangiography. Abdominal access, uh, for abdominal access of the catheter, it is best to use and select uh, which port site uh, has the most direct access to the cystic duct. And this is usually the subcostal area. More often than not, we would insert, if I'm, if I'm doing my common bad lock exploration, I would put my epigastric port just a little bit lateral to the left side uh, of, of the epigastric port. And the cystic duct uh, cannulation will be done at the subcostal area in between the epigastric port and the right lateral most port uh, of, of the patient. The reason for that is you would want to have a direct access to where your cystic duct is. And this port can also be used as your entry point for your uh, cholecystoscope if, you, if you're doing your laparoscopic common bowel duct exploration. So anyway, when we're doing our cholangiogram, uh, the patient is placed at least in 15% from Dellenberg or a heads-down position, allowing for a superior feeling of your proximal duct. 
uh, you can also put your patient a little bit right side down so that the influx or the ingress of your dye towards the liver to be able to uh, visualize the, uh, the, the uh, biliary tree at the liver side. When injecting your contrast, uh, contrast material, you, you, you need to ensure that you need to exclude all the air bubbles from the system. And one way to do this is to flush uh, normal saline through the catheter and then retrograde into the contrast syringe by, obstruct, uh, by obstructing the forward flow. A check image uh, is usually performed just to be able to center the field and to, to be able to confirm that you have an, an, an obstructed view of the whole area so that when you're putting your or pushing your uh, dye material into it, you'll be able to see everything uh, flowing through your common bile duct and even through your uh, duodenum or to your uh, hepatic system. The contrast medium that you would usually use is uh, a concentration of about 45%. Uh, it gives the maximum uh, result. Uh, concentrated contrast materials demonstrates the anatomy better, but may shield small calculi. So we need usually mix at least 50-50 or about 45% of that contrast material to normal saline. You need to dilute it with the uh, normal saline. Uh, other drugs that influence the function of your sphincter of OD can be, uh, you can use your glucagon or your morphine. The morphine causes spasm of your sphincter of OD and the response is directly proportional to the amount of drug that's administered. Morphine administration improves feeling and the delineation of your proximal ducts and is more pronounced in patients with a flappy sphincter of OD. Uh, glucagon, on the other hand, is a smooth muscle relaxant and has a very intense hypotonic uh, action. It counters, uh, counteracts the spasm of your sphincter of OD. So it opens up the sphincter of OD, uh, giving off a better feeling and a better feeling of that uh, common bile duct distal to that uh, uh, to where you're injecting it and going into do it to your duodenum. So more often than not, if you are having difficulty, patients are given glucagon intraoperatively, and you can be able to visualize up to your duodenum. So prior to intraoperative, uh, let me play this one first. Okay, prior to your intraoperative cholangiogram, the junction of your Hartmann's pouch and the cystic duct should be meticulously dissected. You need to skeletonize it to be able to identify which is your cystic duct and which is your cystic artery. From there, it is essential to be able to have a small incision at your cystic duct, a small opening where you can put in or place your, insert your uh, cholangiocatheter. Uh, in this video, uh, we're doing it a, a single incision laparoscopic cholestectomy, but still you can do your intraoperative cholangiogram by inserting a cholangiocatheter through a 14 gauge uh, IV needle. You can do it. And inside that inner plastic cannula, you can put your uh, cholangiocatheter and try to insert uh, in this area. This is now your small cut of your cystic duct. Uh, you'll be able to insert your cholangiocatheter slowly. And then you try to twist it to be able to put it inside. So twisting that cholangiocatheter would facilitate the insertion uh, of your cystic duct. Later on, I'll show you why Sometimes it's quite difficult and quite dangerous to do a repeated uh, uh, insertion of uh, a cholangiocatheter at this area. So if you're using an Olsen clamp or an Olsen cholangiograsper, uh, which is available in the market right now, it's um, some sort of a grasper with a hole in the middle and you can put your either a, any, any catheter uh, uh, that can go inside that uh, area. You need to protrude that catheter at least one centimeter ahead of that grasper and be able to aid it in controlling the tip for insertion at the cystic, uh, cystic duct area. Uh, again, mild counter traction would help in facilitating the insertion of that catheter inside the cystic duct. Then you introduce it to about one to two centimeters and then you clamp it and then you'll be able to do your interoperative cholangiogram uh, using this method. Uh, difficulty in cannulating your cystic duct uh, sometimes uh, can be experienced with 
especially with a very twisted spiral valves of Heister. Uh, threading the catheter usually would uh, be difficult. Hence, you can insert a zebra wire or the guide wire. If you have a friend who's doing uh, ERCPs, you can borrow actually the zebra wire or the guide wire, and you can insert it first prior to the insertion of that uh, cholangio catheter. Infusing your saline uh, would also uh, help out in trying to distend the duct and to be able for you to cannulate the cystic duct. A obstructing or an in impacted stone can actually uh, be difficult, give you difficulty in uh, inserting your cholangio catheter uh, through your uh, cystic duct. An in interoperative uh, ultrasound can actually help identify it if you have a cystic duct uh, obstruction. Uh, difficulties or techniques for different scenarios or difficulty in distinguishing your uh, air bubbles from calculi because air bubbles would also look like a stone uh, uh, during your interpretive cholangiogram. To be able to distinguish it, you may inject contrast material and then withdraw the plunger to create a vacuum. If air bubble is present, usually it would go up, up and down, uh, just like a bubble would, uh, would happen uh, every time you insert it in, in the area. Stones usually would stay, especially for impacted stones, would usually stay in place. So you'll be able now to distinguish which are the air bubbles or the, the stone in that area. So if you can flush the common ball duct with saline prior to the insertion of or flushing of uh, that, that area with your contrast material can actually help out flush out that uh, air bubbles. So again, uh, abnormal appearance of the sphincter uh, of, uh, of Audi can be also be mistaken for a stone. The use of a magnification function of your C-arm or your, uh, of your uh, scope to observe the sphincter in great detail. So by watching the sphincter function, a pseudocalculus uh, may disappear in this area. So danger, shine, uh, danger signs, uh, contrast material, the distal common ball duct with an egress or extravasation distal to your injection site uh, can signify or can tell you that there's a transected common hepatic duct. Hence, the surgeon should be alerted uh, to do an open surgery if you're doing laparoscopic of if you are, or if you're very adept in doing laparoscopic surgery, care should be done to be able to identify any uh, distal common ball duct injury in that area. So another instance is when the distal uh, duct is filled, well filled with contrast, but there's no feeling of the proximal uh, system. If these images do not change with repeated injection or different positioning of the patient, with several maneuvers that we described earlier, there may be an obstructing clip on the common hepatic duct or even a stone, uh, which may not be visible on fluoroscopy. Hence, it should alert again the surgeon to do some other maneuvers just to be able to rule out injury or any clip uh, at that area. Finally, the complications for interpretive colon geography, uh, just like what I've said earlier, a repeated insertion of that cholangio, cholangio character, especially the metal one, uh, can actually uh, give injury to your common ball duct. Uh, if you not, notice the, in, uh, the first video, every time you insert it, it has to be uh, with great care not to be able to put any injury in that cystic duct or even especially at the common ball duct. <clears throat> Dissecting around the ducts or placing of the character uh, can actually produce uh, ball duct injury. Injecting your contrast material under uh, pressure uh, can also induce your <clears throat> bilovenous reflux, which can precipitate septic response, especially if your patient come, coming in uh, already in septic shock. So you can actually induce or push up these septic materials into the biliary tree. Hence, uh, pushing your patient to more sep uh, sepsis. Pancreatitis is also rare. Uh, may, may be rare, but uh, is, has been reported as well. Uh, also, allergic reactions to the contrast material uh, should be uh, noted in, in, in these patients. So before or prior to doing your interoperative cholangiogram, a test for allergic reactions to the contrast material uh, should be done on our patients. So these are other disadvantages uh, of your interoperative cholangiogram 
uh, are your radiation exposure, risk for mild duct injury with repeated ductal catheterization, and of course, massive instruments and manpower required in the OR theater, especially if you're using your C-arm. Uh, you need to have a radiation or your rad tech, radiation technology, technologies who needs to come in and then too cumbersome because you need all, all the team should come out of the OR just to be able to put in or duck in that C arm for you to be able that uh, interoperative cholangiogram. Uh, when we were residents, when uh, there's a scarcity of the C arm, we'd usually use the X-ray, the normal X-ray, and you know just putting in that uh, the the plate right behind the patient's back, and then putting it's too cumbersome and then there's a lot of work. Uh, in trying to do your interoperative cholangiogram. Hence, the emergence and the popularity of doing your Florence cholangiography or, or your ICG or your endocyanin green. So we're now using your ICG, uh, which is one of the newer techniques right now uh, out in the market. So uh, ICG or your endocyanin green was first introduced in the 2008 uh, by Mitsuhashi in Japan. And it demonstrated the vascular and biliary anatomy of the patient. And in 2009, Ishizawa uh, was able to apply uh, the ICG in identification, especially in, the, in, in, in liver surgery and in biliary surgery. So just a recap on uh, what ICG is. ICG is a water-soluble uh, tricarbocyanin that binds to your plasma protein. Uh, it's particularly albumin, 95%, metabolized completely in the liver and excreted in the bile. Hence, the function of your uh, ICG in biliary surgery. So all of it are excreted in the bile and metabolized primarily by the liver. So it utilizes special near-infrared camera to detect its fluorescence. It is administered intravenously and reaches the biliary circulation in about 45 minutes. Uh, the only issue in doing your ICGs on the uh, uh, planning on when and how to introduce the ICG to your patient or the timing of giving the ICG to your patient. It is, it's been given intravenously in a dose of about 7.5 milligrams or 2.5 milligrams to 10 milligrams per uh, reconstituted in a 2 millimeters, 2 ml solution. So usually uh, it's given at least one hour prior to surgery, but in some institutions, depending on the dilution, uh, can be given a few hours prior to doing your laparoscopic cholestectomy on your patient. So just a few uh, studies, meta-analysis done uh, that would show the importance of ICG. So this one is done by Vleck uh, that shows ICG is comparable to IOC in displaying your biliary anatomy prior to your dissection. So it's a pulled data from 13 studies, systematic review provided equal results for successful uh, biliary tract visualization. So it compares IOC and ICG, and it shows a, a good visualization of your uh, biliary tree. So just a small video on how we do our ICG. So outlining of your biliary tree uh, can be seen. So this is your gallbladder now. So this is your cystic duct and then your common bowel duct. So you'll be able to identify it. Uh, the usage of ICG is not really on uh, normal anatomy or a very seemingly uh, normal anatomy of your uh, gallbladder. But mind you, even having said that, uh, Evidences would show you that a common bowel duct injury would usually happen in a seemingly normal uh, anatomy. So be very careful when you're doing this and trying to identify and trying to uh, interpret uh, your ICG. So the nice thing about ICG is uh, you, you need to have a, a specialized uh, machine uh, that can emit a near-infrared uh, uh, view. So you can switch from ICG to white light to be able to identify and be able for you to complete your surgery. So towards the end, you will also be able to appreciate the delayed lighting up of your cystic artery. Because uh, there are other uses of ICG that I'll show you later on in, in, in my slides. 
So other uses of ICG, you can use it uh, when you're doing your colon surgeries, just to be able for you to assess uh, sentinel node lymph node mapping or even for your uh, uh, vascular vasculature uh, after surgery, after resection and anastomosis. So we usually use our ICG. I'll just move this forward in the interest of time. So this is one of our surgeries, our colon surgeries, where we do uh, resection and anastomosis. Prior to the anastomosis, we would try to check on the flow of your blood on that uh, uh, remaining uh, colon prior to uh, anastomosis. So this is how we do it. This is your ICG. It shows a good vascular uh, vascularization uh, of the remaining uh, colon. So that's how we do our ICG. This is now the uh, distal end of the resective uh, line and this is the uh, distal. So prior to anastomosis. So in summary, uh, IOC can lower uh, the rate of bile duct injury to about 29% to 30% as well as reduce the risk of death by at least 62%. In the same way, studies have shown also that the INR or ICG fluorescent cholangiography is safe, effective, and in the early recognition of biliary anatomy. And as such, uh, is comparable alternative to intraoperative cholangiogram. Both imaging technique uh, helps to reduce the risk of baldac injury by providing clear vision of the vital exhepatic structure prior to the dissection. And in conclusion, uh, the safety and effectivity of IOC and ICG have reliable evidence for improving the outcome in the proscopic cardiac, even for open surgery. Hence, the use of either techniques are dependent on availability or the pro of proper hospital equipment, and of course, the staff, as well as uh, the surgeon's expertise and preference. So, uh, as a parting word, everyone should have a good grasp of how to do an interpretive cholangiogram and at least a know-how on how to make use of I ICG. Uh, thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you, Tone. So I'll introduce the next lecturer. The next lecturer will be uh, from Professor Tone. Uh, Lequan Anton from uh, Vietnam, who will be talking about managing interoperative complications. Tun? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we start my section. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'll start my session with uh, managing interoperative complications. And the overall operative communications of uh, large coli is around 5 to 10%, include uh, communication from troca insertion, bleeding, bile duct injury, bowel injury, uh, and finally perforation of the gallbladder and spillage of the stones in the, into the peritoneal cavity. So, communications during large coli have a uh, strong correlation with surgical experience, I think everyone will see it is clear. And from this study from Mama Kiev, you can see that the more experienced you are, the much less communications you get. And you can see here from the beginning, uh, the conversion rate is more than 10%. But when you have a good experience, the conversion rate is only 0.1%, very different. Uh, as well as uh, many other communications like bleeding, BDI, also decrease a lot. So let's talk about communications from trochanter insertion. Uh, we've we've uh, seen the access from other lecturers and uh, from open technique, even we are using the blind technique or closed technique, it is uh, safe. But there is some communications were stated, uh, like uh, intestinal perforation, 
So the troca penetrates the intestine. And if you can recognize that, you can repair it laparoscopically, or you will finish the lap coli first, then you will make a small uh, laparotomy to repair the injury of the intestine. If you have a bleeding from the abdominal wall after insertion of the troca, you can easily manage by direct compression using the troca on the side uh, for a few minutes, or you can use uh, electric cautery, or finally you, you have to uh, stop it by suturing. Or sometimes you got bleeding from the liver, the omentum, because of uh, the penetration of the troca. So it can be easily managed by laparoscopic uh, coagulation. Another uh, common problem is the bleeding from cystic artery. This is uh, the variations from 500 cases uh, I've got uh, from uh, our study. And you see the doubling of the cystic artery is uh, one third of the cases. And two, in 2% two of the cases, uh, you will encounter the right hepatic artery that come close to the gallbladder wall, very close to the infundibulum. Sometimes you misidentify uh, it with the uh, cystic artery. So what, what should we do if you got bleeding from the cystic artery first? Of course, don't panic. The cystic artery is a small artery, 1.7 millimeters in size. It's, a, it's the size of the appendix artery. So uh, it is usually uh, the bleeding is not too severe. And you can easily temporarily stop the bleeding by direct compression using the gallbladder or a gauche or even a lab instrument to make the direct compression over the bleeding site. Then you should take a breath, do the section and irrigation, ask for help if you are not confident with the bleeding, if you are new with the lab coli, uh, less than 50 cases. So you should ask for expertise. Then if it's necessary, you should add more trochas. And then you locate the bleeding site and control the bleeding with the clips. Most of the time we can uh, control the bleeding with the clips or using the electric cautery. Sometimes you have to do suturing, but suturing must be very careful because you can cause the obstruction of the bile ducts when you do the surgery. And it is very important to avoid blindly applying of the clips into the bleeding site. The bleeding is not dangerous, but the, I think uh, the dangerous comes from how you stop the bleeding. And you have to be aware of the bile ducts and right hepatic artery when applying the clips or using the energy to stop the bleeding from the cystic artery. And be confident because uh, from Professor Kashiri, the successful rate is 95%. And from our own experience, it is uh, almost the same. We rarely have to convert to open because of the injury to the cystic artery. Uh, this is a, a post-repetitive uh, communications of bleeding from the cystic artery, uh, but I will show you just to show you how to manage. You see a lot of blocks, and after direct compression, we can easily identify the bleeding site, and you can now recognize that the artery and we apply the clips directly over the cystic artery. Actually, in this case, uh, the patient, I just uh, on a duty and just walked past the patient six hours after a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And you can see this patient have a, a, a 
uh, almost uh, three liters of blood in the abdominal cavity. So I'm, I'm sure that I just passed the first step. Do not panic. So another uh, variation has been mentioned before that the right hepatic artery locate in the hepatocystic triangle. In this case, you can see the right hepatic artery uh, come close to the gallbladder wall and cover most of the area of the hepatocystic triangle. With the meticulous dissection, then we can easily isolate the cystic duct, the anterior and posterior branch of the cystic artery. In this case, mostly the two branch, anterior and posterior, arise differently, separately from the right hepatic artery. You can see this is the anterior branch of the cystic artery, and this is the posterior branch of the cystic artery. Uh, in our center, we usually apply one clip on the proximal end of the cystic artery, and we use a cautery for the distal end. It is safe because uh, cystic artery usually is uh, the end artery, so there will be no uh, blood coming back from the distal end of the cystic artery. Another problem is bleeding from the gallbladder bed. So if there is bleeding come from the gallbladder bed, the strategy is different. Compression, compression, and compression. Then you can easily coagulate. If the injury is deep into the parenchyma of the liver, sometimes you, can, you may cause injury to the middle abetic vein, and that needs the suturing to stop the bleeding. This, is a, this seems to be a simple case. Uh, this video is, is uh, years ago. I think more than 20 years ago. Uh, during the dissection and uh, extraction of the gallbladder away from the gallbladder bed, you see almost there is a uh, no uh, coagulation of the gallbladder bed during the uh, removal of the gallbladder from the gallbladder bed. After that, there was bleeding from the gallbladder bed. The procedure takes around, around 15 minutes till this time. And in this case, the surgeon have to pay another 30 minutes to stop the bleeding. But as you see at the beginning, when we try to stop the bleeding, it's almost impossible and it's uh, inefficient. After that, we decide to do the compression using the gauche. And you will see, it's very simple after that. Here you can see exactly where the bleeding is. I can easily to coagulate at the side of the bleeding. This is a superficial bleeding. So again, uh, bleeding in the gallbladder bed, compression is, uh, I think, the first step. Then comes the coagulation. If the bleeding comes from the right hip artery, it is much more serious than the cystic artery because the right hepatic artery is a 3 mm in size. We have the same strategy, but we have more risk of CVD injury and we have more risk of open conversion. So prepare for open conversion. And when we have to convert, when the patient have a hemodynamic instability, when you are impossible to control or reach the bleeding site safely. 
or whenever you have an inadequate visualization from the camera. This is a, a, a report of Luca from intraoperative hemorrhage, and, and you can see the source is mostly from the cystic artery and from the gallbladder bed. One case, the uh, bleeding from the hepatic artery, and that case have to do open conversion. For a cystic artery uh, or a gallbladder bed uh, hemorrhage uh, bleeding, the conversion rate is uh, very low. I think uh, less than 5% here, only 1% gallbladder bed and around 2 or 3% from the cystic artery. Okay, next will be bile duct injury. Bile duct injury is the most serious or the most fear to the surgeon complications of laterally. Uh, it ranges from 0.25 to 0.74 uh, for major BDI and almost the same for minor BDI. Uh, it is, uh, as mentioned, this is a, uh, correlate uh, closely to your experience of uh, laparoscopic surgery. And you can see that uh, it is reported that significant proportion of injury often happens in your first uh, 30 cases or 50 cases. Again, to prevent bile injury, you have to know about the relevant anatomy, variations, uh, applying CVS during your dissection, and it is also very simple to try to identify the CBD at the beginning of your dissection. It is a tubular structure that is the most lateral and most superficial in the hepatoduodenal ligament. And you can see here, when you access from lateral to medial, CBD must, should be the most uh, lateral and superficial structure rather than the cystic duct. Uh, this is a classification of bile duct injury. I think uh, will be discussed later on uh, when we have uh, uh, cases. So you can see here we have uh, according to Strasberg classification, we have uh, five types of bile duct injury with type A, uh, B, and D. Mostly we have a minor one. For E, we have uh, this is a uh, uh, intraoperative or late strictures of the bile ducts. What is the mechanism of the bile duct injury? For the cystic duct injury, usually it is a technical failure when you do the clipping of the cystic duct or during your irrigation, you cause a slippage of the dislodge of the clip away from the cystic duct. Or sometimes you have a necrosis of the cystic duct remnant due to trauma uh, uh, during your dissection or because of cholecystitis. Sometimes obstruction of the distal CBD by CBD stones cause a blowout of the cystic duct remnant because of obstruction. Uh, this is uh, one of the common maneuver during the isolation of the cystic duct. And we, we have uh, around three or four cases of uh, injury to the confluence of the cystic duct and the CBD posteriorly because of this uh, maneuver. If you do forceful opening of the dissector, you can easily cause a laceration on the confluence of the cystic duct and the CBD. And it is very difficult to recognize during your procedure. Another mechanism is uh, misinterpretation of the cystic duct and the CBD. It's, it usually caused by excessive retraction of the gallbladder during your procedure, or sometimes uh, the anatomy changes, unclear anatomy because of inflammation, edematous condition, or from chronic cholecystitis. So in this, uh, <clears throat> in this uh, situation, Intraoperative cholangiogram will help to clarify the anatomy. Okay, you can use uh, infrared like uh, Alan has show, show you. And now I think uh, Canstock has a new system, Rubina, 
you can do uh, overlay. That means uh, you can do operation with infra, uh, infrared at the same time. You don't have to switch the light. It's very useful. Another uh, technique that causes uh, CBD injury is a phosphorus dissection in the hepatocystic triangle. I will show you later. And sometimes overuse of diatomy in hepatocystic triangle that causes a less picture of bile ducts because of uh, thermal injury. This is, uh, I think, the most common uh, mechanism of CBD injury. This is a misinterpretation of the cystic duct and the CBD with excessive uh, retraction of the infodermalum of the gallbladder that makes the CBD comes up to the gallbladder and looks like the cystic duct. At this time, you will clip and transect the CBD, A is a cystic duct, and clip and transect the common hepatic duct, A is a cystic artery. So you cause a transaction, segmental transaction of the CBD. This is a, a video I record from one of my uh, experienced uh, surgeon. But as you can see, at the beginning, this is uh, identified as the cystic duct. The CBD is uh, far behind, uh, far here in the hepatobiotic triangle. And the surgeon tried to isolate the cystic duct using the blunt tips of the dissector. But somehow he did some sharp dissection in this area. And you can see the, the bile is coming out with, together with the blood. The surgeon still tried to forceful go through the tissue, although there is resistance, as you can see at the tip of the dissectors. Okay, what happens at the end of this dissection? Okay, after clipping the cystic duct, you can see now this is a CBD with a big opening at the anterior wall and one opening at the posterior wall of the CBD. And uh, the injury was closed, primary closure using uh, suture. This is another demonstration of how uh, BDI happens. This case have uh, acute cholecystitis and the surgeon is uh, di uh, dissecting in this area. This is a duodenum and he thinks that this is a cystic duct. This is a cystic duct. And during the section, you can see, he thinks that this is a cystic duct. This is the impacted stones and this is a gall bladder. And during his dissection using the hook, he caused a, a injury with my leak here. So then I comes in and try to dissect along the duct that has been misidentify the cystic duct. And you can easily see that this is the cystic duct, which has been obscured by inflammation. And this uh, cystic duct is short. Now everything is clear. This is a CBD. This is a common hepatic duct. This is a impartic stone. It is a short cystic duct, and this is the right hepatic artery. So because uh, this is a partial transaction of the CBD, I decide to do the repair over the T-tip. So we have a good experience of uh, closing the CBD in uh, 
laparoscopic CBDE. So we decide to repair over the tube tip. Although this uh, bidac is a small, just around four millimeters in size. So we start closing the posterior wall of the CBD first by simple closure. Okay, then we put in a T-tip and close it. The, this T-tip is the smallest one. We keep the T-tip for two months. After condensing crap, there is no stricture, and then we remove the two tip. Closing the T tip in small by duct is difficult, but in this case, uh, we are doing good jobs. Then we clip the cystic duct and remove the gallbladder. This is uh, after the closure of the CBD injury. Uh, another thing is uh, a barren duct has been discussed before in the variations of the anatomy of the bi ducts. In this case, after cholesterol, you can see that this is a, a barren a sectional posterior right hepatic duct that come close to the junction of the cystic duct and the CBD, and this is very small. It is very difficult to recognize. If you cannot recognize it, you can easily cause injury to these tiny ducts. This is the same, uh, another case. And that's why we should not use uh, energy. We have to use as less energy as possible in the hepatocystic triangle. This is a, another type of aberrant dust that the cystic duct uh, join the right accessory or right aberrant ducts. If you do not recognize this variation, then you can cause an injury to the aberrant right hepatic duct. This is uh, also a very interesting videos on this variation. You can see this is uh, the gallbladder has been removed from the gallbladder bed with a large impacted stones in the infundibulum. But the anatomy is strange. This is a CBD. This is a cystic duct. And there is a big duct that connects the infundibulum to the right liver. Okay, what should we do? Okay. In this case, we open the infundibulum, remove the impacted stones, and we recognize that there, is, there are two openings of the ducts into the infundibulum. Then we do the cholesterol. And on the cholesterol, you can easily find out this uh, kind of variation. So the cystic duct join the aberrant right posterior sectional duct and these stones cause uh, some sometimes like a Mirisi syndrome type 2 into the aberrant right sectional duct because you can see the dilation of the duct above the impacted stone area so in this case we can recognize the anatomy and then we close the uh, infundibulum by sutures without injury to the bi ducts. And we have, uh, in three years, we have uh, 19 BDI, mostly transferred from other hospital. And you can see here type A, more than uh, around 60%. And most of the case uh, we can do uh, we can treat it with ERCP and stenting. Most of the type E, we have to do surgery with hepatic cochechinosomy, around 30%. And 10%, we can do conservative treatment. This is uh, from 19 cases in our center. Another problem is uh, Mirisi syndrome. 
Meiji's syndrome is a uh, uh, extrinsic obstruction of the common hepatic duct due to an imparted stone in the cystic duct or infundibulum of the gallbladder. It accounts for 2.7% of the cases. And you can see here, uh, if the stone imparted in the infundibulum, that makes uh, the compression directly to the common hepatic duct. Or in the second type, there is a fistula of the gallbladder wall and the uh, CB. So the key is to recognize the difficult situation of medici. You have to recognize it because it is very easy to cause an injury to the bile ducts in medici syndrome. So again, the technique is open the infundibulum, remove the impacted stones, keep your dissection close to the gallbladder wall. Or if it, it is not, it is impossible, you can do subtotal cholecystectomy as a bailout procedure. And the convert to open to, uh, the conversion to open cholecystectomy is around 41% of the cases. This is an illustration for Mirizi syndrome. In this case, uh, this seems to be the cystic duct that connects to the infundibulum, but there is another tubular structure over here. So it looks like this is the cystic duct, but we cannot uh, identify the CBD. So, and this, this seems to be the hepatic, uh, common hepatic duct. So again, we decide to open up the infundibulum. I'm sorry. We transect the infundibulum, and as you can see, inside is the uh, impacted stones in the cystic duct. So, And then we close the stump, the, the remnant of the cystic duct by closer, uh, by uh, sutures, ligation. Another common problem is a uh, duct of Lusca. So after removing of the gallbladder, you can see the, you can recognize the bile leak from the gallbladder bed. Most of the time you can recognize a small duct comes directly from the parenchyma of the liver. And if it is possible, you can clip it. Sometimes it is too short or too close to the parenchyma. So you have to close it by closer and it is totally safe. Most of these ducts are small. If the duct is big, you have to do the cholesterol to see whether it is a major duct or not. If it is a major duct, you have to do the repair. You have to do hepatic cholecystectomy, but most of the time, this is a small duct. You can ligate, clip, or close by sutures. Okay, next will be bowel injury. It is a very low incident from uh, 0.07 to 0.5. Mostly, it's more intestine because of adhesion. Sometimes it is a colon duodenum or stomach. The cause is uh, from your dissection or when you do the adhesive lysis, or sometimes it el electrocautery burns during your dissection and tearing when you graft it for retraction. The bowel injury can cause a severe intra-abdominal infection post-operatively if it is remained undetected during surgery. So you should inspect the abdominal cavity after surgery before you withdraw. These are some of the mechanism from direct coupling that cause uh, injury to the bowel or insulation failure. Because we are using the reuse uh, instrument. So sometimes failure of the insulation can cause a problem. The problem is that you cannot recognize this injury because it is not under your scope. This is sometimes you have a capacity coupling 
also cause a bowel injury beyond our inspection, beyond our visualization during the surgery. So beware of these kind of uh, mechanism of injury caused by electrocautery. So to prevent bowel injury, you should always uh, using energy under direct vision, safe use of surgical energy and inspect the abdomen at the end of the procedure. Another problem is uh, fistula, cholecystal duodenal fistula or cholecystal colonic fistula. These are rare condition and only 25% you have a preoperatively diagnosis of fistula. It is usually very difficult to achieve uh, CVS and you have to be a very experienced surgeon to deal with these kind of uh, lesions. And you should consider additional trocars in these cases. In, and in experienced hands, it is safe to do laparoscopic cholecystectomy with fistula closer. And you do not hesitate to convert to open if it is uh, not safe. The last one is the uh, gallbladder perforation and spill later stones. It happens in five to 10% of the cases. It's a little bit time consuming to collect the stones, but almost no impact on the clinical outcomes. Residual stones in the perit peritoneal cavity can cause a late complications such as an abscess or fistula. We have a one case, uh, the patient have a intra-abdominal abscess after six years of lab poly and because of residual gold stones. When we do conversion to open cholecystectomy, again, conversion is not a complication of lab poly. This is about the priority of the patient's safety. And when you should convert, first, unclear the anatomy or inability to obtain CVS. Then you can convert to uh, bailout procedures like a subtotal cholecystectomy, cholecystostomy, or uh, even open surgery. When you got uncontrollable situations like uh, massive bleeding or BDI or whenever you get unprogressed after 30 to 60 minutes of dissection. For summary, uh, bile duct injury is still the most serious communication of blood poly and early detection and proper management is also very important. And you know how to prevent it at the beginning. And the culture of safe cholecystectomy may help to prevent BDI in every step of the procedure. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, about post-operative complications and injury and management, uh, let's welcome Professor Ier Shidar from Singapore National University Hospital. Uh, Prof. Hello. Thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to um, share the um, experience with bile duct injuries and, this, <clears throat> and for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Um, so uh, a lot has been covered. There was a lot of videos uh, which were shown by Dr. Thun and it was very, very interesting. So um, I, will, uh, I will try and uh, make it faster. And uh, knowing that uh, the attention span is usually quite short, and especially if you're all try tired, um, I have no disclosures. I will start with the key take home points. So in case you uh, sign off or in case you feel tired, uh, at least the key takeaway messages are still there. So less than 50% of biliary injuries are suspected and diagnosed at the time of operation only about 25-30% at the time of surgery. So majority of the bile duct injuries are present, are, do present afterwards. Um, there was an interesting note about uh, surgeon experience and, uh, and bile duct injuries, but it's noted that bile duct injuries do not occur uh, only in the hand of inexperienced surgeons, and it can happen with well-trained surgeons also, although their complication risks are lower. Use of sills with caution. Uh, 
it is associated with better cosmesis, slight advantage in terms of pain in the early post-operative period. It does take more time. There's higher risk of umbilical hernia and a slightly higher risk of bile duct injury. We quote about 0.3% of bile duct injury for routine laparoscopic cholecystectomies. Now, if we do SILS, it is 0.6%. You either say it's either 0.3 or 0.6, or you say there is a 100% increase. So the patient need to know the pros and cons of each approach. Intraoperative cholangiogram does not reduce the risk of bile duct injuries. It allows for earlier detection and sometimes it decreases the severity of the bile duct injury. Most of the bile duct injuries, uh, or rather often bile duct injuries happen in the elective <coughs> because of cognitive impairment. And it's not really, although acute polycystitis, um, uh, aberrant anatomy, surgeon experience, they are all risk factors, but often it occurs in an elective surgery. Early management is important, not early definitive repair. Attempts at repair by the primary surgeons gives inferior results because majority of the people doing laparoscopic cholecystectomy are general surgeons. And it is essential that the repairs are done by experienced hepatobiliary surgeons. Intraoperative repair by experienced HPV surgeons may give excellent results, both in short and long term, as shown by uh, Dr. Thun in the previous. Uh, so don't attempt what he does, uh, rather let him do what he does well. Um, prior adequate attempts at repair can compromise later definitive repair. So if the first attempt at repair is always the best attempt and it should not be an incomplete job, a duct-to-duct -duct repair usually gives inferior results compared to Roux and Y uh, anastomosis. So now I'll come to the scope of the talk and some of the key elements that again, I need to um, go through in more details. I'll speak about the relevant anatomy, short, uh, uh, a short uh, uh, touch upon classification systems, importance of early detection, investigations and management, early versus definitive uh, late repair, what to do in complex situations and other complications. So important to know the blood supply of the bile duct, they come in the three and nine o'clock position. So often if the injury to the bile duct is because of energy devices, it does compromise the vascular supply of the bile duct and compromised vascular supply will lead to a compromised repair. So uh, it is essential to understand the anatomy of the, of the arterial system to the bile duct. Um, most of the classification system, most often we use the Strasbourg classification, which is a modification of the bismuth classification of bile duct injuries. However, a lot of classification systems are not adequate because they don't take into, they only focus mostly on anatomical aspects, very little focus on mechanism of injury, timing of presentation, mode of presentation, the condition of the patient during the presence of sepsis, associated vascular injury. The closest classification system that is most comprehensive is the EAES classification, which is a little more complex to use. Per ELSA can come up with a classification system which is more practical and easy to use. Um, what is the need for early detection? So early detection leads to early management. It reduces morbidity and mortality. It reduces sepsis and delay, leads to early referral, increases the treatment options, uh, reduces uh, patient dissatisfaction and hopefully litigation and results in lower cost. How do we do a, get to early detection? Now, high index of suspicion, there are some intraoperative clues. It's a difficult cholecystectomy. A surgeon recognizes an easy one from a difficult one. Mm -hmm. Subtotal cholecystectomy. Um, if you see a subvesicle duct and you clip and divide, I usually would say put a drain in because you never know. I mean, you have to do a cholangiogram or methylene blue test to see certainly if there is no bile leak at that time. But even then, it can lead to bile leaks need for controlling some bleeding near the porta, intraoperative findings and intraoperative cholangiogram findings are not very optimal or not well recognized. If let's say you don't see the filling of the upper ducts, if you don't see one side of the liver getting filled. So these are suboptimal uh, intraoperative cholangiogram findings and uh, these lead to index of suspicion. 
postoperatively patient is not settling even after 24 hours some abdominal distension ileus not able to take well persistent tachycardia uh, some degree of dyspnea all these are um, uh, red flags uh, of course fever the clinical presentation can be varied it can start start with sepsis with peritonitis cholangitis liver abscesses collections it may present with just some derangement in the lfts uh, not necessarily jaundice it can present with jaundice it can present with external biliary fistula leak in the drains collection on scans uh, done for suspicion of can complications it can present with fistula uh, with or without jaundice um, it can present with complications of the stricture or vascular injury which includes uh, cirrhosis and uh, portal hypertension it can be an incidental finding so um, now if patient presents with peritonitis uh, relaparoscopy aspiration of the bile good washout and uh, and put in drains if the patient is very sick if the patient is in shock then laparotomy as a damage control type of surgery is uh, done no attempt at repair at this stage attempt to visualize the site of the ongoing leak do not blindly clip put clips even if you see a leak um, because ideally you should do a cholangiogram you should identify what what so if you are not having the right setup uh, it is preferable that you do a damage control put drains and come out um, we need to do ercp mrc mrcp followed by ercp to visualize the site of the leak and then to stent in a stable patient it allows us time to investigate manage the sepsis fluid and electrolytes drainage of collections um, if there is a delayed collection then uh, if the patient goes home and comes back again uh, urgent scans in the scans we look for collections we look for ileus gas pockets concomitant injury liver perfusion uh, if if there is any collection it should be drained and if there is a bile in the drain and it continues um, then we do a ercp and put a stent in um, so this is a patient with a a collection post operatively and then did a ercp first a pectoral drainage and then ercp which shows a sec leak from a sectal duct um, this uh, settled with stenting alone uh, there are other imaging modalities which we use kintigraphy to detect uh, it is in my mind hida scan is useful mostly to rule out bile leaks rather than to see where the bile leaks is because um, it is often very unclear where the source of the bile leak is it can be useful in establishing the biliary ductal continuity uh, mri mrcp is very useful in looking for collections ascites biliary liver and biliary anatomy and uh, um, assessing the leaks especially if you have uh, the uh, secretin uh, induced uh, mrcp options um, the role of ercp can be diagnostic as well as therapeutic uh, of course we do ercp only with a com combination of mrcp I'll demonstrate why it is essential to have both modalities. Um, in terms of diagnosis, it can tell you where the what the anatomy of the bile duct is. It can demonstrate any ongoing bile leak. Uh, therapeutically, small leaks uh, or cystic duct leaks, subvesical duct leaks, um, it can settle down. If it's an incomplete bile duct injury, sometimes stenting and repeated stenting can uh, work. Um, so again, this is a bile leak from cystic duct stump. Uh, so prior to definitive repair, make sure you exclude or control sepsis, evaluate the liver function, including the coagulation profile, delineate the Strasburg bismuth type of injury, including MRCP, PTC, and ERCP, evaluate the liver anatomy, see if there's atrophy, hypertrophy complex, uh, see the perfusion, um, uh, and use CT or MRI to uh, to do this and detect associated vascular injury, if any. So this is a patient who um, uh, had a bile duct injury and then a surgeon was called in to repair. He did a hepatico jejunostomy. And after the hepatico jejunostomy, the drain showed that there is bile. So subsequent scan showed that there is bile leak. Now what has happened is, again, some cognitive impairment. You see the uh, MRI, it's not very clear here, but these two ducts over here were joined in the Rue anastomosis, but this duct, it looks dilated because it, uh, it's done after a while, but this duct was small at the time of repair and the surgeon repairing the bile duct did not see the duct. So there was a sectoral duct which was missed in the uh, first repair. Uh, why, again, there is this patient who 
had a uh, cholecystectomy six, seven years ago. And then he presented with derangement in LFT in a routine health check, and then went to a gastroenterologist for further evaluation. And then they subsequently did a, uh, um, uh, ultrasound followed by MRI, which shows that the right-sided bile duct was completely clipped and divided. And this patient subsequently needed a right hepatectomy. So the surgical uh, options in bile duct injury are laparoscopy, washout, drainage as a damage control, laparoscopy or laparotomy, uh, cholangiogram, clipping and suturing of the cystic duct stump if it is from there, um, suture repair over T-tube, uh, duct to duct uh, anastomosis over with or without T-tube. Again, it's a very limited option. Uh, if the, there is no thermal injury, it's a sharply divided duct. There is no ductal um, uh, occluded duct, not divided duct. Uh, there is no loss of duct. Then in selected cases, we can do this. Otherwise, the default option is laparotomy with the uh, RUNY hepatocogenostomy. Um, uh, liver resection, and finally, liver transplantation if there is major complications. So again, a duct to duct uh, uh, anastomosis can be done in very, very selective uh, situation. Otherwise, this is the ideal option where we go high. The left duct is usually longer than the right duct. The left duct uh, has a, about two centimeters of extra hepatic course. Mm -hmm. And cutting the across the left duct exposes the right and left duct orifice into a wide orifice, and we can easily do a 1.5 centimeter um, uh, anastomosis at a high level. And this is a very old paper, but this is a very useful technique even now. Uh, vascular injuries, um, uh, largely unknown what is the incidence is because people don't look for it. Uh, mostly data available from tertiary hospitals. Autopsy studies, older autopsy studies showed 7% uh, with open cholecystectomy. Earlier studies with uh, lab cholecystectomy showed a high incidence of uh, uh, vascular injuries associated. But most recent uh, studies in the um, uh, 2000s showed the incidence to be about 17 to 19%. It increases the incidence of septic complications involving the right liver. Uh, it increases the incidence of anastomotic complications, leaks, fistula, post after the repair. Increased incidence of late strictures requiring interventions. Persistent raised alkaline phosphatase may predispose to secondary biliary cirrhosis. Um, and uh, increasing, uh, it increases the technical difficulty during definitive repair. Um, we must suspect vascular injury in all patients with bile duct injuries if they are referred from outside. Um, uh, so you should look for it uh, definitively with a CT, uh, contrast and CT scan or uh, MR angiogram. Uh, so this is the um, uh, plexus um, of uh, uh, omega hyalur plexus, which, uh, which has happened after a clipping of the uh, right artery, and, and uh, there is a cross circulation from the left. Um, now, portal vein injuries are rare, thankfully, about 4% uh, of all uh, vascular injuries. Again, if that happens, first thing, no panic, pack, and then call for help. And then Pringle maneuvers can help in trying to uh, control the situation. If you are with a laparoscope, there is a possibility. If you have the equipment of a laparoscopic bulldog clamp, you can just place it across the uh, hepatodural ligament and get a HPB surgeon to help before attempting to uh, do a primary repair. Um, uh, role of liver resection in early bile duct uh, injuries, uh, only if there is ischemia and necrosis of devascularized liver, do we need to do a liver resection. Uh, in late situations, complex intrahepatic biliary strictures. I've shown you one uh, presentation where the right uh, duct was completely clipped and the right, right liver was uh, atrophic. Um, if there is no reconstruction option for the right-sided duct, chronically damaged liver. So these are the indications for doing a liver resection. Um, results of liver resection uh, based on most studies, early res resections mm -hmm. are associated with a higher risk of mortality late resection, delayed hepatectomy has better outcomes. Um, now, when there is late presentations, no vascular reconstruction should be attempted. Uh, most of the times you should have a strategy based on what the anatomy shows at that time and be prepared to take sectoral parts of the liver out or uh, do a liver resection. Um, uh, vascular resection uh, reconstruction can be undertaken only in limited scenarios where it's an intraoperative call and 
and interoperatively, if you need to do a bile duct uh, ruin wire reconstruction, it is better to have a vascular reconstruction if that is necessary. Otherwise, most of the situations we know need to do vascular reconstruction. Just a controversy about early versus delayed repair. The pros of early repair is shorter hospital stay, less intervention, low cost, better quality of life. But again, the data the literature uh, shows worse outcomes, higher restructure, uh, restructure uh, and complications. With delayed repair, the pros is less acute inflammation, better long-term results. But the cons are the more you delay, more interventions are necessary. The possibility of a current cholangitis, sepsis, and of course, uh, delayed presentation can lead to uh, cirrhosis, malnutrition, poor quality of life. Ultimately, the timing of repair is more dependent on timing of referral, and that is more important. Uh, it is not the timing of, um, it, is, it is the availability of uh, HPV surgeon, the timing of uh, referral, availability of resources, and adequate assessment. That's what matters more. So the patient has to be right uh, for a definitive repair, not sick. Uh, the right surgeon has to do the repair and the right operation needs to be done. Um, the other things are basically complications are post cholecystectomy syndrome. Again, think about all these things, CBD stones, remnant cystic duct stones, symptom of OD dysfunction, bile duct injury, extra biliary causes, um, uh, extra intestinal causes, psychiatric and neurological disorders, coronary mm -hmm. disease, mm -hmm. intercostal neuritis, and unexplained pain syndromes. For biliary colic, uh, when we do lab colleagues, uh, about 5 to 10% get post cholecystectomy syndrome. The other injuries has been already covered, bowel, abscess formation, vascular uh, injuries, uh, these are the incidences. But again, what gets surgeons to litigations is the bile duct injuries. So with that, I would thank you very much for your attention and happy to take questions. Thank you, Prof. Uh, David, let's go to the uh, question. Yeah. Questions and answers, and then we go to the MCQ. Okay. Thank you, Alan. I think I need to thank all the, the speaker. I did there. And of course, you, Alan, and uh, Toon, excellent uh, program. And speaker, uh, outstanding. I think we make, you need to make use of this material, excellent material. We have 217 people that. Uh, never drop uh, during the two hours. It means uh, they are all really interested and uh, they, I, I'm sure they thank all of you. Let's start with the polling. And in the meantime, you and uh, Toon, uh, Shrida, you can start a, a bit of discussion. I will run the poll. Uh, the poll will have three, say three, the poll, we have three poll of, uh, uh, 10 questions each. So we will run for uh, 10 minutes each. Please, all the attendees, I remember that uh, all the people want to have uh, not only the certificate of one part, but the full certification. They need to pass uh, with at least 70% uh, the MCQ for this part one, part two, and then upload the video for the procedure. The video will be assessed with the a professional uh, editing tools that is validated by even the sages and the most of the society worldwide. Alan, you can go ahead with discussion. Yes, uh, we, we can start off with uh, the questions at the Q&A box. Uh, Tun, if you allow. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we can start off our discussion with some of the questions that were asked at the Q&A. Can we put out the questions at the Q&A? <clears throat> okay, I think uh, the first question is, uh, which port is reduced in three-port technique? I see that Min Hai has uh, answer. Yeah, in the three port, actually, we we take out one of the trocars, the right lateral trocar. So you still have your epigastric port, your umbilical port, which is your optical port, and one uh, 
uh, right, right, right lateral port, right? Yeah. We, we all do the same thing for our sure. three parts of me. Sure. But in all your procedures, tool right now, you all uh, always do your three parts, right? Yes, always. Yeah. We we always start with three parts, and of course, if it is necessary, we do not hesitate to put in an, an additional one. It's, it's simple. Yeah. In, in, in our practice as well, we are doing uh, sometimes three ports and uh, we have a very threshold to go with the uh, fourth port, 5 mm, in the right axillary line whenever it's needed. I think there's a question of if, if you can't achieve critical VR safety, could you always convert without any intraoperative imaging? Uh, is this in connection with the three port or just the uh, on a four port and then cannot achieve the critical view of safety. Anyway, uh, if it's in relation to your critical view of safety uh, with the three ports, an additional, uh, another port uh, to make it a four port to help you uh, retract that gallbladder to the lateral side and then try to open up and then try to uh, open up that triangle of calo would actually help. But if it's with regards to you're doing a four port now and you can still cannot identify the critical view of safety, I think an intraoperative imaging is better rather than converting it to an open outright. Uh, uh, what do you think, Tun? I think another thing we can do that is uh, we do cholangiogram directly through the gallbladder. You don't have to identify the cystic duct. So it's except that there is an impacted stone in the gallbladder neck. Otherwise, you can do cholangiogram and you can somehow identify the situation. If there is impacted stones in the gallbladder neck, open the gallbladder infundibulum and remove the stone and try to do the cholangiogram. And then you can do like a normal cholecystectomy or a subtotal cholecystectomy. You don't have to convert to open. Anyway, convert, conversion to open is uh, the last step uh, if you cannot do anything. I agree. How, how about you, Professor Sida? I, I would prefer not to convert. Um, but again, I, I go for a possible subtotal colitis section. Uh, try to get the fundus first approach. My threshold for uh, conversion to open surgery is basically uh, very frozen callus strangle and uh, um, and uh, 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 this patient, uh, uh, let's say, had a previous subtotal cholecystectomy, had uh, uh, problems with uh, recurrent, uh, uh, you know, burden of stones in the remnant pouch. These kind of unique scenarios. But otherwise, I would prefer to. Uh, go take the fundus down and then open the uh, heart pump pouch, get the stones out and try to do a cholangiogram uh, and then slowly creep towards the, uh, the cystic duct rather than, uh, uh, you know, rather than convert. Because with current uh, uh, imaging, uh, the laparoscopic setup, our visualization is actually better than open. Thank you, Prof. How about you, David? David is busy. <laughs> uh, I, I'm busy with so many questions. <laughs> uh, we are talking about three ports versus four ports. I think, I think it's... Uh, David, uh, if you cannot identify the critical view of safety, yeah, uh, and then the intraoperative uh, imaging is not available, uh, what other steps can you do just to be able to complete your gallbladder, uh, your gallbladder surgery, either you convert to open, or are there any other maneuvers that you do, just for you to, to be able to do it? Okay, there are few 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 things that you can do. First of all, go down and look for the CBD. Uh, it can be tricky. It depends on the experience you have. Another one is to go and do a top down cholecystectomy. Uh, you can uh, either open the, the gallbladder and look for the cystic duct, 
there are different tricks that you can go and, and do uh, and do and do to, to rescue if you don't have call and Joe and everything. Yeah. Thank you. There's a lot of talks about bailout surgeries right now. But I think the most important part would always be once you're in, in the surgery itself in the middle, uh, try to assess for the anatomy. Uh, I always would tell my, my fellows or my residents to bring out that telescope again out, and then try to look on the bigger picture again, the anatomy, the liver in relation to the gallbladder, in relation to your duodenum, and of course your common baldac, where your, your common baldac would supposed to be. Sometimes yeah. get so, uh, so, so focused on trying to finish the surgery that we forget to get a bigger picture of where we are. And that's where we sometimes get lost. So I think that's one part of that uh, procedure, okay. technique, or tips that we can give. And of course, if you are, uh, uh, your experience is less than 100 lap cholestectomy, I believe, laparoscopy cholestectomy, I believe calling a senior surgeon is the, probably the most sa uh, savior maneuver that you can do. No more than any surgical trick. <laughs> I, think I would agree that a prevention of a common ball that injury is better than trying to identify an injured common ball. Yeah. Try to injure the, the, the CBD if you haven't done yet. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions that you would want to? Can we? Uh, talk? One more comment on. Uh... Conversion to open surgery, I would be very cautious. And if, let's say, if the patient is erotic <laughs> and you find that the gallbladder is difficult uh, and there is some portal hypertension features, uh, bailout is even taking out, uh, opening the gallbladder, fishing out the stones, and putting a tube there is safer than trying to convert and continue with cholecystectomy in a cirrhotic. Very true. I would like to add with uh, Professor Sidis. When you decide to open up the patient, try to run, to run in your mind. If you open the patient, what are the steps that you're going to do just to be able to identify it? But sometimes we get so panicked because you would want to finish the surgery and then you feel so frustrated. You tend to uh, go more into difficulties uh, once you open it. So try to run it in your mind on what are the steps that you are going to do once you open the patient, and then try to reflect if you can, you'll be able to do it uh, laparoscopically. You have to remember your vision is better laparoscopically because you can actually zoom in. So these are the things that you need to look at and try to ponder upon on how you would want to proceed. But of course, calling your senior or calling your friend or even your junior, uh, two or three minds trying to help out and trying to do one procedure which is still better than just you alone trying to solve the, the problem. Any other comments from uh, Sajid? Any comments or Binhai? So uh, there's, <laughs> there is another question. If you find a small bilic from gallbladder fossa during laparoscopy, what should be done? I think uh, <clears throat> I have a show clearly on my presentation that uh, you can clip, you can close it by sutures. And yeah, um, yeah it's simple. Can I add a comment on that? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. if the cystic plate, I mean, the video you showed, the cystic plate yeah. was uh, intact. And in such situation, uh, we may find the duct and we may be able to clip it. Yes. But there are situations where uh, the cystic plate is taken off. Uh, it's all frozen. Uh, and then you get a bile leak from uh, a liver tissue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we really don't know where the source is and you can't go digging inside. In this situation, <laughs> it may be okay to probably put one or two stitches if you are good at laparoscopic uh, suturing. Basically, yeah. laparoscopic suturing with liver is even more difficult because the sutures don't pour. But mm -hmm. after that, always do a cholangiogram and see what duct has been affected. And yeah. probably put a drain and then probably this patient will need a ERCP or a 
uh, stenting to decrease the pressure so that the the leak settles down this probably a sectoral duct in the gallbladder bed agree absolutely yeah we have launched the second poll uh, please all the participants uh, try to answer within 10 minutes. Uh, in the first poll, in the first MCQ session, we have uh, 135 respondents. Uh, we will wait for another 10 minutes and then we will have another one, last one with another uh, 10 MCQ. That we have a total of 30 MCQ. So just a reminder to all our participants, for you to be able to get the certificate from uh, ELSA, the complete certificate, uh, you have to finish the MCQ after every uh, session. So we have three sessions. Uh, once you've done it, uh, the, uh, please submit it to, uh, to ELSA Secretariat and then uh, you'll be able to get the certificate for safe policy stepping. Any other issues that you would want to uh, ask the panelists, please write it down in the Q&A uh, box and we'll try to answer it. There is some question interesting about uh, a patient that underwent a pre-op sphincterectomy. If still uh, the cholangio is useful uh, to do or and or is uh, require some uh, special uh, trick because uh, to keep the, 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 the contrast within the bile duct. Anybody want to, I saw Srida reply, any comment from Srida or from uh, Tun? Yeah, totally agree. The uh, patient usually in the, luckily we have uh, the patient head up, but in this case we have to uh, uh, make the head down position. And uh, I think most of the time that's enough. And head down or a little bit tilt to the left because the left uh, side is uh, above the right side. So a little bit tilt to the left with the head down can uh, easily yeah. achieve the best result of cholangiogram. Yes, so what the role of uh, IOC after sphincterotomy? There is a role of IOC yeah. after the sphincterotomy? Yes, of course. Yes, yes. Still, yeah. Um, if the LFT has not settled down completely, I mean, there are some which is pre-operative uh, determinant. Uh, LFT is not settled down completely. Um, uh, it, it is on a downward trend, but alkaline phosphate is uh, persistently remains high. Um, the uh, intraoperatively, if you find the anatomy to be uh, difficult, preoperatively, it is also very thick walled gallbladder. Uh, the Hartman's pouch is compressing on the bile duct. So, these are uh, some indications where even if there is a sphincterotomy before, uh, I would still do a cholangiogram. Uh, there's a question which I think we need to address uh, and quite important. Uh, the question is regarding explanation upon correction of gallstone leakage from the gallbladder. Although it is said to have no effect on clinical outcome, it could cause abscess later. So I'm confused how to proceed in that situation. I think Toon was able to uh, explain it uh, earlier. Uh, although statistics will show you that it doesn't have any much effect on patients, uh, care on trying to collect all the stones should be uh, sh should be done on the patient because a few years after the surgery, uh, patients can come back with uh, abscess. So uh, even uh, there's a caveat in, in the in the lecture of Tun. Right, Tun? Can you expand on this one? Yeah, yeah. I just mean the spillage of bile does not uh, can cause no difference in outcome. Not the uh, resilient stones you have to remove all of the stones by any means. Any other things that we need to... Uh, can we go up on the, the next question? Yeah. 
is there a danger with experienced surgeons to be too proud to convert to open ending up with your, is there an incident straight to this? Well, mm, we call it uh, surgical ubri. Uh, trying to, you know, surgeons trying to finish uh, the surgery because they look at trying to convert patients to open as a failure. Uh, time and again, I think in, in all of the lectures that we would give, even uh, not, not with uh, ELSA, uh, all the surgeons who's lecturing on laparoscopic cholestectomy, we would always stress that conversion to open uh, is not a failure, should not be seen as a failure. Uh, first and foremost, we, do, we should always look on the safety of, of our patients. Right? Any comment on this one? May I ask, um, Alan, may I ask yes. you? In your presentation, you will choose 45% uh, of contrast. Why is this so difficult? I will make one one, 50%. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the 45% actually is in the textbook. Uh, if you read our textbooks, it's always that one. But in practice, I would always do a one is to one uh, dilution. And uh, depending on what you're using, if you're using a C arm or if you're using a static uh, X ray. Uh, so it really depends on how the technician, uh, the radio technician would mix up your, your uh, X ray, uh, X ray film. But you are you are not doing by yourself by your own. No, I, I do it on my own if I'm using. We my, used to do uh, you read by ourselves, right? No. Oh. Um, um, yeah. Doc, uh, Prof. Allen, um, I have one small comment about the conversion to open. If you don't mind. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah. Um, there was a comment about experienced surgeon uh, converting. Uh, I, I recently converted a patient uh, to open cholecystectomy. Co um, I just want to say that uh, I've been doing uh, HPV for about 15 plus years. So uh, this was a patient who had a laparoscopic uh, rectopexy about uh, 10 years ago, uh, a, a lady in the middle ages. And then a uh, post laparoscopic rectopexy, the patient was in the hospital. This was 10 plus years ago. So all the records were not available. Was in the hospital for about two months with sepsis and she had multiple intra-abdominal collections. And then those collections were drained by percutaneous drainage. And when I see the patient in the clinic, when the resident presented, they just told me like laparoscopic rectopexy and didn't tell me about all the complications that had happened. And I saw the patient abdomen had small, three small scars. So, so I said, okay, can do laparoscopic cholestatomy. So I went through the umbilicus. I could not find anything because it's all plastered. <laughs> abdomen. Then I tried to go from the right upper quadrant and then when I put the laparoscopic in, I see PC, like a colonoscopy view. <laughs> so this is a patient I have to convert <laughs> very quickly, then and there. <laughs> so, so as you said, uh, instead of frozen callets, it was a frozen ab abdomen this side. Correct. This yeah. well. <laughs> so, I, I however, however, whoever the surgeon, however proud, whatever it is, it is a humbling experience that you should have conversion at the back of your mind. Yeah, absolutely. I think the next question would be, what did you do to your resident? <laughs> uh, no, no. <laughs> Just the importance of past medical history. I think that is yes, extremely that's important. Right. That's right. Yeah, because, you know, you don't have all the 10 years ago, what has happened to the patient is not available at the tip of the finger. Yes. And then after the surgery, I had another detailed discussion with the patient, of course, after telling what, why we converted. She said that I was in the hospital for two months and uh, I was suffering and I had multiple percutaneous drainages and, you know, prolonged antibiotics. <laughs> yeah. uh, easy. Me too. Yesterday, I, well, I was doing a, a TP and uh, I found a small scar. I say, I, I asked the, the any, any, anything. So this patient, no, no, professor, just a bilateral head. Yeah. Okay, good. Then I saw a scar on the bilagus. I said, what is the scar? Oh, no, nothing, prof. We got the robotic prostatectomy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I say. Uh, we, we have another question. What should be done in setting up a cirrhotic patient? Who presented with empyema, gallbladder, 
put on operative picture, you'll see a lot of dilated vessels and even gallbladder bleed to touch. What should be done in this patient? <clears throat> I, th I also have uh, some experience with these kind of patients. I, I think uh, the best first uh, you can do is uh, to do um, percutaneous uh, drainage of the gallbladder first. When everything is settled down, then go in again, try to do cholecystectomy. Otherwise, you can do uh, percutaneous uh, stone removal of the gallbladder if the patient, patient is too ill. Yeah. Do not try to do subtotal cholecystectomy because uh, there's a lot of bleeding at this time. So uh, empyema, yeah. yeah. trunk, I think, uh, yeah. drainage first. Or you can do yeah. uh, cholecystectomy under laparoscopic uh, view. Yeah. yeah. I think this is the right option because as Dr. Sh uh, Professor Shreda has just mentioned, about cirrhotic liver, um, um, when you are dealing with the cirrhotic liver and um, at the same time patient is in sepsis and in pyema. So better to go in, if you want to proceed with the laparoscopy to go in and remove the stones, put a drain inside, let the infection settle and then come back again. Even if the, uh, probably there won't be need of any, uh, maybe future subtotal cholecystectomy if you can proceed. There are the, another question interesting about the the T tube ma, tube T tube management. Tun, you want to explain a bit more? Uh, actually, I, I really uh, don't understand the question. When and how long to leave the T tube? So it means it, when you do a, a, a when you position a, a T tube in, in the bile uh, duct, that means so uh, repair how you, of how injury, you manage right? it, yeah, in oh, terms yeah. of uh, probably uh, post clearance or cholecystectomy for any reason. Uh, I prefer to uh, put it uh, at least uh, four to six weeks, at least. Yes, correct. Uh, some recommendation is uh, three months, but um, I'm not sure that three months is better than six weeks. So I will keep my, our two tip six to eight weeks. And with a cholangiogram can identify we, uh, there is no problem, there is no stricture, and we can remove it. And, and after that, you should follow up the patient. If there is a early stricture, you should uh, do the stenting or dilatation by ERCP, via ERCP. There's, there's always a chance of uh, less stricture uh, after uh, by that injury repair. Any experience done on after clearance, uh, either colitoscopic clearance uh, of a primary repair of the common bile duct? Because uh, we have reports also, papers coming out that a primary repair, especially for common bile ducts that are larger than one centimeter, you can do a primary repair without any incidence of uh, stricture. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. We do yes. not have, we have an almost uh, no cases of uh, stricture after primary repair of the bile duct. But you have to be, uh, you have to have good experience on closing of the CBD. Yeah. Because um, some of the surgeon take a very big bite on other yeah. side. Yeah. So you can, right after the closure, you see stricture of the CBD already. It is not late stricture. So closing the CBD technique uh, is uh, very important because it, you take, uh, I think, uh, adequate bite on other side. There's uh, no chance to uh, late stricture. Very true. Minhai, can you want to say something? Minhai, about? I want to say, yeah. Yes, um, about the primary closure of the CBD. Um, firstly, I agree with the professor. Um, we don't have any case about the less structure after primary closure. And, um, but um, the, um, 
the the things um, we are afraid about that is the, the infection. Uh, I, I mean the, the um, acute cholangiectasis uh, after we uh, do the primary closure, uh, especially in the uh, acute cholangiectasis before we do the primary closure. And uh, as uh, Professor Tung um, discussed. Um, the, the skill to close uh, the um, uh, CBD is very important. And I just uh, mentioned about how to check the bio leak after we finish the procedure. Um, I share uh, my experience. Usually we do, uh, we, we apply like the liver resection. We use the small gauze with, the, and after that we use the uh, clean uh, water to um, to go it and we, um, we we wait and we check by the change color. I think this is the most important. Thank you, Minai. Are there any we, other questions? We have a one raised uh, hand by the attendee Jerry Raphael. Maybe he can write a question. If there is no other question, I will make a, a short announcement. Uh, meanwhile, we have still four minutes. Uh, I will share. So uh, after this, the part two of this event will be on. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. I wrong. Will, let me get there. Will be on uh, 13, right? Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Okay, we'll be on uh, May 13. Everybody can see? Yeah. Yes, and uh, we will, uh, everybody will receive uh, an announcement and uh, we will be focusing on, uh, on video. It's a video masterclass. Uh, we will be almost the same speaker, so high quality as you see today with more video on the technique on basic lab cole, maybe more difficult case a bit of more about imaging, how to treat complication, how to do a, a cholecystectomy in acute uh, setting and emergency. So this will be May 13. Uh, in the meantime, on May 6, because of some other uh, logistic with other concurrent conference, shop sharing, I will, we will have another event coming up that is the uh, laparoscopic ventral hernia events. Uh, will be organized by our Japanese colleague. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, so it's many. May 6, it's uh, another one. Can you see the ventral hernia? It's the 6th of May. Yes, it's 6th of yeah. May. Yeah. Uh, it's 6th of yeah. May. Uh, we will focus on the same concept. Uh, it means uh, yeah. part one will be lecture and test, mm -hmm. then video master class and uh, virtual and so on uh, skill training to get a full certification. And uh, we will focus on ventral hernia repair, uh, about classification anatomy, the basic one, basic concept about umbilical hernia repair, IPOM, uh, and then extraperitoneal repair and complication. Uh, the, second, the second part will be the end of the month and we'll focus mostly on video master class and the same with the same quality of speaker will be going on. So I hope you can join who, the people who are interested in, uh, in this webinar can join us uh, uh, on, uh, on both uh, Ventral and LabCole. And then subsequently, uh, I believe in, uh, in, uh, in June, July, we will have uh, inguinal hernia and uh, we hope to do something more in, 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 the, in the months to come. Alan, what we can do more? Bariatric, colorectal. Uh, we're planning a lot of uh, 
sessions, uh, also live hybrid uh, sessions for you. So please uh, stand by and then uh, wait for some further announcements. But yeah. rest assured, Elsa will be here to give all the educational uh, help for, for all of you. Yeah, if you have any list, you said to me, we can, we can share on uh, Elsa app. Sajit is back from uh, UK, so he can start to work again yeah. on the Elsa app and then so on. And then uh, the online courses will be uh, launched probably within one or two weeks time. Yes. I have uh, excellent stuff moving on. The basic course and energy already completed. We are just uh, uploading the, the, the file. Yeah. And then after that, we will move on with the, probably the lab call. It will be the next one. We see. Okay, we can conclude. Uh, I pass the microphone to Alan and uh, Tun to conclude. We still have 190 people online. Anyway, Alan. we would like to thank everyone for joining us uh, uh, for, for this uh, webinar. Uh, we hope that uh, you'll be able to finish until part three, and hopefully you'll join us again in the next uh, few webinars uh, in the future. Tun? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We have a lot of people here, right? Yes. Yeah, we have 191 participants. Of, uh, attendance. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Bye bye. I think we. Bye. Yeah, bye bye. Thank Good you, everyone. Thank bye you. Bye bye, Alan. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Sajid. Okay, goodbye. Bye, bye. Minai. Yeah, bye, Paul. Bye. I can't bye. see that. Bye, Alan. Thank you, Dr. Ah. Yeah, oh.